Church, let me invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. We're going to look this morning at Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 13. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 13, and we are embracing hope this morning. Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning in verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shufan, and Gamariah, the son of Hilkajah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. As the text indicates, this was a message that God sent by way of Jeremiah to the exiles who were at a critical point during their time after they had been sent out from Jerusalem. You know, when, when, you, when you first experience something that is out of the norm, y'all remember back in 2020, right? When we went into exile, you know, we called it uh, staying at home. We, we called it uh, all of those things. And we thought, you know, well, this is going to be for a few weeks. And a few weeks turned into more weeks and weeks turned into months. And then people started talking about that becoming the new normal, remember? And I'm thinking, oh, no, this is not going to be normal. Now, we don't have any control over when this ends, but it is not going to be the new normal. We're going to endure it. We're going to go through it, but, but it's not going to be the way that it is forever. And thankfully, it, it didn't end up being the way that it is forever. But, but after a while, they, they had gotten to that point where they're beginning to think, oh, maybe this is forever, but, but we want to go home. We want to go back to Jerusalem. We, we don't want to be here forever. When can, we, when can we go back? Certainly, God is going to show up and God is going to begin to move us back to Jerusalem. The prophet's message was pretty straightforward. To begin with, he says to them, verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And then he goes on, he says, build houses, live in them, all of those things. What is he saying to them? He's saying, you better be where your feet are. Thank you, Bill. Barge your, barge your phrase there. You got to be where your feet are. Don't long for the way that things used to be. Don't long for the way that things might be someday in the future. You've got to live in the present. And he says, for right now, you need to understand you are exactly where I have you. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles, who? Whom I have sent. Whom I have sent. God brought them there. God is the one who sent them there. Now, yes, he used the Babylonians. He used King Nebuchadnezzar. He, he used all of that. But God's making it clear. You are where you are because I put you there. 
And church, y'all have heard me say this for the last four and a half years. Our address is no accident. The fact that Huffman Baptist Church exists at 700 Huffman Road in the year of our Lord 2024 is absolutely no accident. Now we understand that 114 years ago, when a group of settlers made their way that long journey from, from Chalkville to Huffman, it wasn't called Huffman then, and as they thought about, you know, that's just too far to drive back to church. We go through Chalkville to go eat lunch on Mondays. You know, it's just, yeah, some of y'all come to church, just, you just drive right through there, it's no big deal. But 114 years ago, apparently it was a big deal and they felt led to start a church right here in this community. They had absolutely no idea the growth that this neighborhood would have, that it would grow to be one of the largest population centers in the city limits of Birmingham. They had no idea, but God did. God knew it. Amen. And God knew that at this point in time that we would be sitting in this room and that we would be thinking about where our feet are. We would be thinking about our neighborhood. And what, what God is saying to them through this is, he says, number one, you understand, I put you there. Number two, he says, get comfortable and settle in. Get comfortable and settle in. Don't always be longing for the way things used to be. Don't always be longing for something that's in the future. Get comfortable and settle in. I am so thankful that by the time I came to be your pastor, you had already decided we're gonna get comfortable and we're gonna settle in. Now you may not have understood what that exactly looked like, but you had said, we're gonna get comfortable and we're gonna settle in. After going through a period of about 10 years where, where not just one committee, but two committees, do we leave or do we stay? Do we leave or do we stay? Do we leave or do we stay? And the decision is finally made, we are staying. Now some decided, no, we're not, we're leaving, and they left. But you decided to stay. You said, we're gonna get comfortable and we're gonna settle in, we're gonna be where our feet are. But we're not just going to be here. We're not just gonna gather as ourselves. We're going to make the community better. Which is exactly what God said to them. He said, I want you to get comfortable. I want you to settle in. I want you to build houses. I want you to get married. I want you to have children. I want your children to get married and have children. And then he says in verse seven, to seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. You know, it would have been really easy for the Israelites who are in captivity. Now understand, the Babylonians took them there by force. They came and they destroyed their cities in Jerusalem and in and, and Judah. They destroyed what was there and they forced them to disperse throughout the Babylonian empire. It would have been really easy to have maintained an adversarial position toward their captors. But God said, don't do that. God said, I don't want you to look at your neighbors as the enemy, I want you to become their advocate. I don't want you to have an adversarial relationship, I want you to be their advocate. I want you to work for the benefit of those who live around you. You know, it doesn't say it here, but we understand that one of the reasons that God sent them to Babylon, yes, we know that they went there because they've been disobedient, God was get, getting their attention, it was part of their sanctification. But the other part of this is that, that God, God's people represent God in the world. And wherever we go, he wants us to make him famous. Amen. Wherever we go, he wants us to make Jesus known. And, and God sent them into Babylon literally to make Jesus known. Now you say, wait a minute, Jesus wasn't born then. But they went there to make Jesus known. You know how I know that? You know which empire followed the Babylonians? It was the Persians. It was the Persians who sent the three representatives, we say three because they brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but they came from the Persian Empire. Why? Because they had made Jesus known. They had said that God would send a Messiah. They had prophesied that Jesus was coming. They had made Jesus known, and the Persians, because they had been there in captivity, they came to see Jesus. See, see we, we, we look at that we are here when we say that our address is no accident. What we mean by that is that we are here to be a gospel lighthouse for this neighborhood. 
I remember a conversation I had with Ted Debro maybe two, three years ago. Ted Debro, if you don't know, is the president of the Huffman Neighborhood Association. And we were having a conversation about uh, what we were attempting to do here at Huffman. And, and he was lamenting the, the reality that, that once upon a time, the churches in this community were the centerpieces of the neighborhood. And how that had gotten to the point where it wasn't that way for a period of time. Well, by the grace of God, I can tell you that we look back. I think this neighborhood looks at Huffman Baptist Church now once again as a centerpiece of this community. We exist to be a neighborhood church for Northeast Birmingham. That's the Huffman neighborhood, this, the Roebuck neighborhoods. It's even the trustful area, it's center point. It's, it's all of this whole pocket where there are 70,000 people who live within a 10 minute drive. We exist to be a neighborhood church for them, to make the community better. Amen. Now, one of the other things that happens, and, and some of you will remember especially if you were on the search committee that brought me here, you will remember that I think maybe the first words out of my mouth were these. I am not gonna tell you what you want to hear. I'm gonna tell you what you need to hear. And I think I've done that pretty well for the, consistently for the last four and a half years. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. Look, look, at, look at what comes next in verse eight. In verse eight, he says to them, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Now, other translations insert this statement. Do not dream the dreams that you want them to dream. Do not, dream, do, not, do not listen to the dreams that you are putting in their minds to dream. They're getting this from you. They're telling you what you want to hear, not what I'm telling them to tell you. Therefore, they are false prophets. See, one of the next things that we need to understand God's message to them and it's to us is don't listen to people who just tell you what you want to hear. Don't listen to people who just tell you what, you're going, what you want to hear. Don't listen to the dreams that you encourage them to have. You aren't going to change God's mind. That's what's his message to them. And, and I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful that we don't have to fight that fight here. That, that we, don't have to, we don't have to do that. Now, y'all may have fought that fight a decade before I got here. But, but for the last four and a half years, we've not had to fight that fight, which means that we are able to embrace the hope that God has for us. Those way familiar words of verse 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, plans to give you a future and a hope. And haven't we seen that hope emerge over the past several years? I, I, I think maybe the first time that, that it became something of a, this, this may actually happen, was the Sunday that we announced that Banks Academy was moving onto the campus. Uh, that is a Sunday I will never forget because we honestly had no idea how the church was gonna respond to that. I thought you'd be excited, I thought you'd be happy about it, but I had no idea how the church was going to respond. And I remember it started back here in this back corner a standing ovation that made its way all the way across because for, for, with, there's hope. There's gonna be life here. And I remember the, the first Friday afternoon that I came, came to do uh, chapel for or, or the pregame devotion for the football team. They were downstairs in the fellowship hall. It was a Friday afternoon, it was about four o'clock or so. And I got here, Maxine is working, working the, the welcome desk. And I mean, it is loud. It is unbelievably loud in the fellowship hall. And I'm thinking, I don't, you know, I wonder, I wonder how, you know, because this is a church and I wonder how, the, and Maxine goes, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? We, we, we began to think, okay, there's, there's hope. There, there, that God does have a future for Huffman Baptist Church. There, there is hope that is here. And then last year's baptisms. Oh, what an incredible time. And the growth of our young adult Sunday school class. Scott, I want to bring up that picture or Reggie, whoever's running it. I don't know if y'all can really see this, 
but this is our young adult Sunday school class and their kids and nephew, and they went bowling last Sunday after church. Now, I want you to understand something. None of these people were at Huffman Baptist Church two years ago. Not a single one. And look what God's done. And then, as I shared last week, all of the messes that God's turned into miracles just over the course of the last 10 months or so. We know that God has a future for Huffman Baptist Church. And aren't you glad you stuck around to begin to see it? You know, to me, the, the worst thing, I, I've shared this with some of you before, but um, one of the things that I have prayed for my entire ministry was that God would allow me to stay somewhere long enough to see the fruits of the labor that we put in. Because the worst thing is the, you leave somewhere and you look back and you go, well, it finally happened. You know, and you're like, well, I'm not there to be a part of it, but you, you're here. You're here. So we continue to seek God. That, that song that we sang, I trust in God, right before the message, so perfect. Going along with what God says, okay, I've got a hope for you. I've got a future for you. Now, here's what you got to do. You got to continue to seek me. You got to continue to pray. And I'm going to answer. And when I answer, you got to make whatever adjustments in your life that you need to make in order to join me in what I'm doing. It's a process that goes on and on until Jesus returns. So I, I, look, at, I look at 2024. And in, in many ways, this is a transition year for us. Because it was five Januarys ago, or four Januarys ago, this is my fifth, so January of 2020, that I stood in right here on this particular Sunday and I revealed to you, I know y'all can't see this, but our vision 2025, the next chapter. And in that vision, we began to lay out where God was taking us. And what we said was that by 2025, go ahead, yeah, by 2025 in this next chapter, we will become a family of churches who are sending transformed people to make Jesus known across the street and around the world. That's been the direction that we have gone. That's been where we have been headed. In this next chapter, we will become this family of churches. Four years ago, None of us, if we're really being honest, we knew there was one more chapter, but we really weren't sure, is this gonna be the last chapter? Well, I can say with pretty good confidence right now that the answer to that is no. There's at least one more after this one. In this next chapter, we will become we will become. One of the things that we focused on in that next chapter vision was not that we were going to have growth, because you can manufacture church growth. You can, you can get people in the pews. You, you can make things happen. But, but we said we want to become. We want to become because this is a spiritual thing. In other words, what we, what we understand is, is just like what, what the Lord said to them, that you're going to seek me, you're going to pray, and I'm going to answer, and then you're going to respond, and you're going to seek me, and you're going to pray, and I'm going to answer. Nothing happens apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we focused on that. We will become a family of churches. Now, at that time, we were a family of two churches. And we kind of looked at it as we're two churches in one location, together for the gospel, together for the neighborhood. Kingdom Family Christian Fellowship, which is a church plant that we kind of helped to birth. Uh, they meet on our campus. And so for the longest, it was just the two of us. And then along came a phone call in February of 2020 from First Baptist Church Centerpoint. They were kind of at a point where they were looking and saying, we're probably not going to be able to exist for much longer. And so we began to have conversations with them about maybe absorbing them into our congregation here. Well, COVID hit and they kind of backed away from the table and then they ended up closing and their members kind of scattered to other places. So we, had, we kind of had a false start there. Then we talked to their, their Hispanic church about possibly coming and joining with us here and, and that just kind of didn't work either. Well, I, I don't, I'm not able to give you details at this point, 
And I alluded to this last week that there's some things going on that will be game changers if, if God works them out. But yesterday, a, a delegation of our leadership met with uh, the leadership of another church in our community, a church that um, I think 30 years old, 40 years, 30 years old. Um, they, uh, I, I, again, it just looks like that, that they're not gonna be able to continue on for a number of reasons as a separate standalone congregation. And, and they reached out to us and, and asked about the possibility of the two churches becoming one, actually not two churches becoming one, of them joining with us. And so those conversations are going on. And I can tell you if that happens, it'll be a game changer. Uh, look around and think, think about maybe 20 to 30 more people in the room that are not here today. We don't know exactly what God's doing in all of this, but we know we're gonna be faithful to take each step, one step at the time, and let God work it out on his own timetable. You know, when we kind of came in, I, I had a vision of us replanting churches, and I hope we would be at a point five years down the road where we were healthy enough that we could then begin to take our DNA, our commitment to generosity and partnerships with the gospel and, and our, our, perseverance, our persevering attitude and our willingness to be innovative and kind of take our DNA and, and then begin to go out and help other churches that were in decline and maybe help to begin to replant them. I don't know that we'll be there by the end of this next year, but I do believe that's in our future. I do believe that God wants what's happening at Huffman to become a model for what can happen in other places around this city so that God's glory will be declared. In this next chapter, we will become a family of churches who are sending transformed people. Focus on that word transformed because when someone comes to faith in Jesus, by the way, and again, this isn't my story to tell. I'll let him tell the story himself in a few weeks when he's baptized. But uh, a young man who grew up in this church, um, his mother was a faithful member. I'm not gonna go beyond that. But he had reached out to a lady in our church who had reached out to him during a very difficult time in his life and talking about spiritual things. And she said, can I get one of our pastors to meet with you? And he agreed. And he and I had coffee on Thursday morning. And in the course of that conversation, he came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Amen. And he wants to be baptized here. Probably won't end up going to church here, but he wants to be baptized here as a, as a testimony of what God has done in his life. It's not just about getting people wet in the baptistry or even then getting their fannies in the pews. It's about life transformation. And so what, what he just made a decision to do is to follow Jesus. It's the same decision that many of us made at some point in our lives. And, and when we made the decision to follow Jesus, it was then to begin to be transformed by Jesus. To then allow him to be able to make changes in our lives and to make us to become more and more like him. And so we are sending transformed people. We have we've, we kind of redefined what it means to be a member of the church. We talked about this in terms of gathering and growing and going. That a, a, a disciple, someone whose life is being transformed, they gather with other believers. They're growing in their faith. And then they are going to make Jesus known. I think about gathering. I think about our worship. If you were around four and a half years ago, our worship's just a little bit different than it was back then. And some of you go, yeah, it is. And some of you go, yeah, it is. And, and, and just so you know, my heart, and, and I think Richard has adopted this as well, our, our, our focus, mute me real quick, I'm fixing the cough. As I could. We have found our worship voice. And, and, and our, our focus is every person in the room, every, maybe not on every song, but every person in the room at some point should feel like there should be very few Sundays that you walk out of here and go, you know, there was not a single song that we sang that I was not able to connect with on a heart level in my worship. Now, it, it, it's going to happen from time to time. And we're still kind of evolving in all of that. But we've begun to, to develop and find our worship voice. And I know we've had some conversations. Richard's got some things in mind that I think is going to even refine that even more as we go forward. 
We have a stable financial base. Now, I know you're sitting there going, wait a minute, Pastor, you told us last week that basically we're out of money until we get the parking lot sold. If it wasn't for the insurance money, we, we would be out of money. And that is true. But, but one of the things that I do when I'm consulting to a church, especially in the area of their finances, is I, I have a little thing I have them fill out that kind of breaks down. I don't want names, but how many people do you have that give this amount? How many people do you have to get this amount? And kind of look at a, a giving profile of the church. So I've done that for us over the last two years. And I can tell you that even though our overall dollars that were given last year decreased a little bit, there are more people carrying a more even load of the burden than we've had in the past. That's healthy. We are on a more stable financial base now than we have been in a very long time. And God's gonna build on that. As we look at going into this next year, we, we're, we're going we're gonna to try to continue to develop that generosity among our membership. We're also going to begin to develop some legacy giving opportunities. Uh, we kind of joked about it during the, the generosity campaign that, uh, in fact, one of our members said, I'm going to give all of mine uh, this first year because I'm not sure I'll be here for all three years. Well, the reality is, in a, in a, none of us know what tomorrow holds, right? But, but for those of us who are uh, older, um, there may, why not develop opportunities if you, if you so desire to, to leave Huffman Baptist Church in your will so that God continues to bless and to use the ministry here going forward? So we're going to develop those legacy giving options if you want them. We started small groups this past year. <clears throat> Again, talking about sending transformed people. We started some discipleship-based small groups this year uh, that are gonna multiply over the course of the next few years. Now that's, I'm talking about over and above Sunday school. Sunday school is still kind of our primary gathering and growing for most of us, but, but to go a little bit further into the disciple-making process, we started some small discipleship groups. We want to make disciples of those whom we baptize. Again, we don't, we don't want someone uh, who just comes to faith in Christ and they join the church and they sit on a pew. We, we want to actually allow the Lord to transform their lives. We were talking about it in the hallway this morning. I think we're at a point where we can begin developing a student ministry. Uh, we, we talk about middle school and high school. We've, we can begin to, to enhance our children's ministry. I mean, we got some pretty good things to work with. Y'all saw the picture, right? It's time to begin developing a student ministry and expanding our children's ministry. So in this next chapter, we, we are becoming a family of churches who are sending transformed people to make Jesus known across the street and around the world. What an incredible response. You may remember that one of the things that I challenged the church to do is for all of us to engage in community ministry of some sort on some level. And I have been so encouraged by the willingness of the overall membership of this church to get involved, whether we're going back to that first year that we did the, the Christmas giveaway thing over in the, in the ministry center or um, the food distribution that we do or uh, the incredible way that you reached out to Banks Academy students this past December at Christmas, uh, the way that we've reached out to elevate students in the past, uh, just, an incredible response of our people in community ministry. And I think it's time to build on that. This next year, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to build on what Nicole has gotten started with the food ministry. I'm excited. In fact, I walked up on, on Bill and Ginger having a conversation in the hallway this morning and they were talking about this very thing that I'm about to say. I'm excited about the possibilities for us to be able to use the hub, as we're gonna call it, which is what used to be the Welcome Center and the Administration Office, if you haven't been down there, it doesn't look like that now. I'm excited about the possibilities of us using the hub, using the community room, some of you remember it as the parlor, and even using the library to enhance our ability to do ministry in the community, of bringing people into our facility 
And, and again, how God took a mess and turned it into a miracle that has allowed us to be able to do that. Next week's gonna be our fourth GIC to celebrate partnerships. And that's one thing when I look back, and you remember last week I said direction is more important than detail. When I look back over our partnerships and where I thought God was gonna go there, it blows my mind what God has actually done. It's just so far, and, and I believe that, that those partnerships are only going to enhance. Now, it may be that some of the partnerships change, but particularly with Banks Academy, I do believe that that, that partnership and the ability for us to do ministry, to reach families, to, to baptize students, to make disciples of those students, and yes, even to be able to welcome some of them into our fellowship, I believe that is only going to grow in the course of the next year, two years, three years, five years. Amen. As we complete this next chapter this year, we're gonna begin thinking about the next chapter. It's back in the summer, Danny Brister and I were headed to lunch and. Danny asked me a question. He says, where do you see Huffman Baptist in five years? And I kind of laughed and I said, well, I see it in a very different place than I saw it five years ago. And we began to kind of talk about what some of that meant. It's a great question. It's a question I hope you're asking. Where, where, do, where do you see the church in five years? I'm gonna modify the question a little bit though because I'm gonna be looking out eight years, not five, but eight. You say, well, eight's a weird number. You know, normally you either think five years or 10 years. Why are you gonna think eight? Because eight years from now will be the church's 125th anniversary. That's where, actually seven years, that's, that's where we're gonna be looking. Where are we gonna be? Actually nine years. It's me doing math from the pulpit. 2033, when is that? That's nine years from now, right? Okay, thank you. I'm, not, I'm never allowed to do math from the pulpit. I got a math teacher on this side, and I got a math teacher on that side. But it's the non-math person who called me on it back there. Church, I wanna encourage you with two words. These are gonna be our two words for this year. Embrace hope. Embrace hope. God is not finished with us. God is not finished with you. And I'm gonna say a word to those who are, are here, especially if you're a guest, maybe you are, don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hope has a name. Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us. There's no hope for any of us outside of a relationship with Christ. And so if you're in this room this morning, if you're watching online this morning and you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, I'm gonna invite you to do exactly what I led that young man to do Thursday in the middle of the day. Embrace hope. Embrace hope. You know, one of the things I was sharing with him, he's talking about how messed up our world is and, and, and even talking about, he said, my, even my own life, is, it's, 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 a, it's a wreck. I said, look, none of us deserves to be loved by God. None of us. God created this world and he made it good and God had a perfect design for this world but sin entered into the world and so we are living in brokenness. It's all around us. Brokenness is everywhere. It's not just in our culture, it's in our own lives. And the reality is that because of that brokenness, we don't deserve to be loved by God, but we had this longing to get back to what God's design was. And when we try to do that on our own, the reality is that, that we're trying to get back to God's design, but it pushes us further and further away. And that's why God said, I'm gonna do for them what they can't do for themselves. And he sent Jesus into the world to make a way for us. And the way that we return to God's design is, is not by trying to fix our own lives because we're just, look, I can mess up anything. I can mess up anything. Don't say amen, but I can. Especially from this corner over here, the people that know me best. I can mess up anything. 
And so if it were up, for, up to me to fix it, we'd all be in trouble. But God said, I'm going to do for them what they can't do for themselves. Jesus says, trust what I've already done for you. Because I gave my life on the cross of Calvary to pay the penalty for your brokenness and to make a way to return to God's perfect design. That's a beautiful picture of the gospel. Embrace hope. Father, I pray this morning that we as a church would continue to embrace hope. God, I pray this morning that there might be one person either in this room or watching online, God, who needs to embrace hope this morning. Who needs to trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Father, would you speak to our hearts this morning? And God, would you work in ways that only you can work? As we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.